So it's 12 o'clock, so let's get started. Again, thank you everybody for joining us today. We're very happy that you're here and you've taken time out of your day to join us for our last of our six part lecture series. So we have two great speakers today. So let's get through the intro real quickly and then we'll um, have plenty of time for our speakers. For those of you who do not know me, I am Deneen Bertel and I'm the readiness coordinator for care operations. And I'll be uh, essentially your host for today. And um, we'll introduce our speakers um, right before they speak. So again, this is the OWCN lecture series number six. And today we're gonna be focusing on um, hearing about the species prior prioritization index and also a little bit about resources at risk. So today is the last of our six part lecture series. So um, if you've been with us before, thank you so very much. And if you haven't joined us yet, um, we have recordings available on Canvas through your uh, responder profiles. So if you wanna view any of our previous lectures, uh, please do so and they will, um, you will have access to them for some time. So um, we invite you to do that as well. So this will be the last one for this year. Again, today we're gonna to be talking, um, we're gonna hear about um, a species prioritization index from um, Louise Chilvers of Massey University and then also uh, resources at risk um, from Greg McGowan from California Department of Fish and Wildlife, OSPER. And I will introduce them more formally in just a few minutes. Um, and then finally, we will have some time for some Q and A after each speaker. And then at the end today, if there's time left over, we are also happy to um, entertain your questions um, through the Q&A feature of Zoom. So speaking of Zoom, just a little bit about uh, your Zoom controls. We are in the webinar format today, so you will not have control over your audio settings, but we can um, unmute you if we would like to invite you to speak today. Um, so your audio settings are on the left, and again, that we can, we can give access if necessary. Please use the chat, say hello to us, say hello to each other, introduce yourselves. Um, we'd love to know where everybody's coming from today. And then also for the Q&A, please, if you have a question during a speaker's talk, you can put your question into the Q&A. Some questions we might be able to answer live and some questions we will save for the Q&A after each speaker today. And then finally, uh, when it's time for you to leave the meeting, you can just click this button over here and you will um, be able to exit the meeting today. And then just one final note, we are recording today's meeting. So um, as I mentioned before, you will be able to view this recording at a later date if you would like to. And with that, I am going to introduce our first speaker. So our first speaker today is Louise Chillers, and Louise is the Director of Oiled Wildlife Response from Wild Base, which is located at the School of Veterinary Science at Massey University. And Louise is going to be telling us all about their species prioritization index. So I'm going to let Louise take it away. Thank you, Dane. Um, I will share my screen. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much for introducing me um, and inviting me along. Today I'm going to talk about an old wildlife risk assessment that we developed for New Zealand, but the point is that this can actually be modified and used anywhere in the world. So even though it's specifically about New Zealand, it is very um, ability to go across many environments and countries. So why is my screen not moving? Let's go that way. Um, so obviously, the aim of all wildlife response is to minimize the impacts of oil on wildlife. And prevention is always gonna be our first priority. But if that can't occur, it's about mitigating the effects. So the first step in both the prevention and mitigation is to develop an all wildlife preparedness plan. And I know OWCN has many of those. Um, and to do that, it's to look at the analysis of areas uh, at risk of oiling, the vulnerable species um, to oil and the potential response options that we have for those animals. 
So for New Zealand, it was a case of identifying the vulnerable areas uh, within New Zealand's coastline based on wildlife presence, abundance, uh, biological parameters, such as are they near shore species or uh, likes of albatross that are usually only far shore, potential impacts that oil can have on individuals as well as the population, and our ability with any mitigation options that we have. And that was specifically to guide our capacity planning for the whole of New Zealand. So put, put it in perspective, New Zealand is about the size of California, about the length and about the width. Um, it's just that it's a whole country. Uh, and there are many, many offshore islands that we have as well. So species considered, we considered all of the marine mammals and seabird that are listed in our threat classifications. We then also considered the species or family groups, such as petrels and shearwaters and cormorants and fur seals and coastal reptiles that were highly likely to be involved in high numbers in a spill and species that took specific equipment and skills and personnel, the main ones there being pinnipeds and reptiles. So the method was that we asked a whole bunch of experts in population ecology and veterinarian care and rehabilitation to look at what is the likelihood of oil, looking at the population parameters, the distribution and the behaviour of individuals as well as the species. The impact, so what was the consequences of individuals being oiled, but then what was the consequence of an individual in a species being oiled. So for those species, which unfortunately New Zealand has quite a few of, if there's less than 250 of them in the population, one individual getting oiled will have a massive impact on the whole species. And then mitigation, what our response options are, because actually in New Zealand, we have some um, fairly major restrictions, like we have no facilities to hold and care for cetaceans anywhere in New Zealand. Um, so our mitigation ability for cetaceans is more about prevention than it is about um, being able to catch them and rehabilitate them. So therefore, the priority index came out being looking at the likelihood of oiling, the impact of oiling, that's on the consequences of individuals as well as at the species level, and then multiplied by the mitigation options. So the first steps were to quantify and rank species based on six biological parameters. Um, and as I said, some of them were, you know, are they shore species or uh, offshore species? Do they, do they nest uh, or breed in New Zealand? Um, all those sorts of factors. So assess the immediate likelihood of the impact of oiling on an individual, and then also on the species as a whole, if an individual is oiled, and then evaluate New Zealand's response options for each species. And as I said, calculate priority by looking at likelihood time, uh, plus impact times mitigation and then spatially display this assessment so that we can compare areas of known risk throughout New Zealand. So to have a look at that first step, which is looking at how do you classify or rank species? So in the end, we looked at five marine mammal species and three family groups, three reptile species groups, which was just sea turtles, sea snakes, and shore reptiles, 55 marine bird species plus four avian groups. So here's an example of them uh, in the table below. So we have Maui's dolphins, which is a subspecies of the Hector's dolphin in New Zealand. There are less than 250 of them in the world. There's actually only 55 adult um, dolphins known, actually. They're very restricted in range to the west coast of the North Island, but they're there year round and they're endemic. The reverse of that for a marine mammal in New Zealand is New Zealand fur seals. So well over 5,000, there's actually about 300,000 of those. 80% of them live in New Zealand. Uh, the rest live in Southern Australia. They're New Zealand wide and they're there year round. Um, sea turtles, we don't have very many sea turtles at all. They're only in the north of, of this New Zealand because it, that's the only place that is warm enough for them. Um, so, if an individual sea turtle got oiled, 
it's actually not an impact on the whole species as a whole. Whereas if an individual Maui's dolphin got oiled, it's an enormous impact on the species as a whole. And then I just selected a few other um, species in the New Zealand shore plover, similar to the Maui's dolphins. There's less than 250 of them. They're very range restricted um, and they're endemic. Whereas white herons, there's less than 250 of them in New Zealand, but that's less than 1% of the entire world's population. And then one of the family groups was shags or cormorants. Um, they're, uh, they're mostly not threatened. There's two species that are, but they're all around New Zealand and year round distribution. So looking at all those sorts of characteristics, we ranked the species. Um, and this is some of how the rankings turned out. So again, for Maui's dolphins, you can see up here, the likelihood of oiling is actually very low because they're so sparse and um, minorly distributed. The potential impacts on an individual is moderate for a cetacean, but for a species, one individual getting oiled was a very high impact. As I said, unfortunately in New Zealand, we have very low abilities to response to cetacean. We either have to haze them, deter them or refloat them. Um, but we have no way of holding them in captivity in New Zealand. So overall, their priority actually turns out to be a low priority species. With those criteria, there's, you can see A, C and 3 up the top, which is A is that it's unlikely to get oiled, and C is that we have very limited, no or limited um, response ability within New Zealand. If you take another marine mammal, which is the New Zealand sea lion, so that's different from the fur seals, um, they are an endangered species. The likelihood of being oiled is very high because of that transition being breeding on land, going through the near shore water, but also being uh, very far foragers. You know, they can forage out to 150 kilometres out to sea. The impact of an individual being oiled is not that great, um, but because of their low numbers, um, the impact of an individual being oiled on the species is fairly moderate. Our mitigation ability is moderate. Um, we can deal with everything up to adult females, but we can't deal with adult males um, at about the same size as your Californian um, sea lion females with males being four to 500 kilos. They're a bit big for us to handle. So therefore their priority comes out at about a moderate. If you go right down the bottom to the shags, the cormorants, the likelihood of them being oiled is very high. Uh, the potential impact on individuals, like all birds, is very high. However, for most species, the impact of one individual being oiled on the entire species is pretty low. However, we have the ability to do just about everything with them. We will catch them, we will clean them uh, and rehabilitate them and release them, or we could haze or deter, whatever is the appropriate option. We have all of those abilities. So therefore they come out as a high priority species and something that we would concentrate on to try and um, work with as many as we can. And you can see the rest of that table through the rest of the species, the New Zealand shore plovers, most birds come out as moderate and high, and that's mainly because we do have the ability to do everything um, that we possibly can to mitigate circumstances there. So then tracking that across New Zealand, and these um, this is New Zealand in 20 kilometre chunks uh, around the shoreline. The darker the colour, the higher the priority the species are, um, and therefore the, also likely the higher the risk. So as you can see, around Auckland and up around Northland is very high priority area. Around where Cook Strait is across the strait, just about the entire east coast of the South Island. And then again, around Fovo Strait and Stewart Island are all high areas for birds, high response areas for birds. If we look at mammals, um, there's slight increase up here around Auckland and that's mainly turtles and sea snakes and shore, uh, uh, no, completely wrong species. That's mainly um, dolphins and brooders whales. Around uh, Cook Strait, again, is fur seals and dolphins and whales. And then the entire South, um, South Island is all fur seals and specifically down around here is New Zealand sea lions. So mammals have a different distribution to the birds and then we'll get to the right species. And now reptiles. 
So again, they're very high up around Auckland and that's sea snakes, turtles and shore skinks. Um, and again, the Straits, Fiordland and Fovo Strait. So you're getting a, a bit of a picture of the main areas where New Zealand can respond and has high priority species. And then we look at this and how this corresponds to high risk areas. So everywhere that's bright red are high risk areas. That's Auckland, so one of the biggest ports in New Zealand. Cook Strait has high shipping um, channel going through it. Christchurch area is another port, Dunedin is another port. And down around um, Bluff and the south of the South Island, that's area where there's a big aluminium smelter, there's a port, and there's a lot of tourist, tourism vessels. So we can see that, you know, these are areas that we would have to prioritise. And that was the point of this exercise was to see where do we need to prioritise people and equipment and training to cover our high priority areas and high risk areas. So much of New Zealand's shoreline and offshore areas are high priority and high risk areas. New Zealand has one of the highest biodiversities of marine wildlife in the world because like you guys, we sit on the Pacific Ocean, but we also sit on the Southern Ocean and um, border the Indian Ocean. So we're an island nation surrounded by some of the biggest oceans in the world. We have um, very high endemic species, so species that are only found in New Zealand. We're very critical habitat for a lot of migratory species. And we're the world hotspot for species like penguins, albatross, uh, petrels, prions, cormorants, and terns. So all of those species that you would imagine can get caught um, in an oil spill, in a coastal oil spill. The results of the assessment identified species and high risk priority areas. And these results were compared to New Zealand's current capability, which was at the time, um, personnel and equipment spread evenly throughout New Zealand mainland. So as you can see from those pictures, the, the graphics that I showed you, it meant that we had um, gaps in our capacity in equipment and personnel relative to where the priority and high risk areas were. So what it meant was, um, like Odopacien, we have a full-time mobile oiled wildlife response team based at Wild Base at Massey University. And then we have national members spread across New Zealand. We are well equipped for um, avian and reptile responses, but we definitely showed to have gaps in marine mammals and many of our offshore response capacities. Um, and we had even distribution when actually we needed to distribute resources and personnel more into the high risk and priority areas. So the solution to that was we have, since the study was done, we have started collecting um, or buying specialised equipment and training people for marine mammal response. We have increased our remote um, island capacity with equipment and training for remote island use and increased our national team membership in identified high risk areas. So that's it. That's how we worked out our um, risk priority for all wildlife response. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much, Louise. That was really, really interesting. Uh, if anyone has any questions, we can unmute you or you can just type it in the chat or the Q&A. Okay, Roberto has a raised hand. Deneen, do you have the ability to unmute him? One second. Roberta should be able to talk now. Roberto, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? I don't have any questions. Okay, thank you. Well, I have a question. 
um, while we're waiting for others to, to put their questions in the chat or the Q&A. Um, so Louise, I know that other areas of the world have done something similar in species prioritization. So I was curious how the process of, of going through, through species prioritization, has that differed? Has the New Zealand process differed from um, the same process that, you know, for example, other areas have gone through? And what would have been those differences? I think the main dis difference was um, the last step, the mitigation ability because we are restricted in some of our things, mainly around cetaceans and some of the bigger pinnipeds, um, that needed to go in to work out um, what, the, you know, what areas we can respond to and, and what we can respond to, rather than just saying, these are high risk animals. Um, you know, because we know we can't go and capture cetaceans and bring them into captivity because we don't have any facilities, then it had to be weighted differently. Um, because there's no point in putting a whole lot of resource into something that you can't do. Um, so, whereas we can put resources into sea lions or into birds. So I think that's the biggest thing from the things that I read. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Donatella. So Donatella says, may I ask why there are no centers where impacted animals can be treated and kept in captivity? Um, there is just not cetaceans uh, and we only have one facility for pinnipeds uh, which is Auckland Zoo but everything else um, we don't unlike OWCN we don't have permanent facilities we have a mobile facility so more like your inland spill facilities we take our facility with us and move it the entire length of the country if we have to and set up on the spot um, but it is uh, almost legislation in New Zealand that we are not allowed to permanently hold the animals um, if we cannot release them back into the wild. They are rehabilitated and released. And if they're not capable of going back into the wild, most likely uh, they will have to be euthanized because that's one of our, the legislation of our country. Thank you. Um, Mike says, in conducting the assessment, were there any surprising results that you had not previously identified, aside from marine mammals and offshore readiness? Um, I think the very bottom of the South Island, uh, right down near Stewart Island, was a bit of a surprise. Um, and we certainly didn't have the capacity down there that we should have. And that's mainly in and around um, the bottom of the South Island is such a remote area, but it's so high use for tourism, as well as being an incredible hotspot for um, animals, given that it is just straight into the Southern Ocean from there. So that was a bit of a surprise, but no, nothing else. All up around Northland and Auckland was not a surprise and Cook Strait being, being a strait and you know the high flow of not only shipping, but also animals through there. Thank you. Any other questions? I had one more question. <laughs> so Louise, um, you said that you qualitatively ranked the different species based on six biological factors. So what, what were those factors um, and how were they chosen? Um, it was looking at the behaviour and how that would equate to them interacting with oil in, in the marine environment. So there was, so it was not only um, population size, but distribution. So likes of one of the examples I gave the New Zealand shore plover, um, they are literally in an area of coast about a mile long. That's it. That's the only area that they are. And that coastline is nowhere near a port, nowhere near any oil drilling, nowhere near anything whatsoever. Um, so therefore, because even though they're coastal birds, you know, they're, they're waders, they're only permanently on the beach more or less. So that would biologically put them as very high risk because where they are is nowhere near any, any risk. It brings down their risk um, assessment. So it was a combination of, as I said, um, 
species number, distribution, um, whether they are shore, midwater or offshore species or all three. So likes of penguins and pinnipeds get all three because they come ashore and they're on the shore, but then they have the ability to be foraging out past 100 miles. Um, so it was those sorts of biological factors and specifically thinking of them in terms of how does that interact with oil. Okay. Uh, so Lynn says, did you say that rehab is done at the Auckland Zoo and that there are no marine mammal hospitals in New Zealand regarding pinnipeds? Uh, correct. Auckland Zoo is the only facility in New Zealand that is permitted to hold pinnipeds. Okay. And I noticed the New Zealand dotterel didn't make the list. Is there a reason? Uh, no. It, it, it's on, I mean, I only just highlighted ones that were specific. Um, they're very definitely on there, uh, but they have quite a wide distribution um, throughout New Zealand um, and quite sparse. However, they do rank very highly given, um, you know, they are coastal species and they can get oiled and yeah. And, you know, again, their, op their options, we have options to do everything with them like we did in the arena, which was preemptive capture and hold them so that they didn't get oiled. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any other questions. So thanks, Louise. Really interesting. So now we're going to go to back to Deneen to introduce Greg, our next speaker. Great. Thank you, Louise. And thank you, Kira. Okay. So our next speaker um, is Greg McGowan. And Greg is a biologist who is the program manager of response technology for California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Office of Spill Prevention and Response. So please welcome Greg. Thanks, Deneen. I'm um, assuming you can hear me and such. Um, move this over here a little bit. Uh, so yeah, I'm a biologist with OSPR talking about resources at risk. This is actually part of a bit longer presentation, so I cut it down for 20 minutes. So I'm going to move fairly quickly um, as I go through this. I can get these to go. There we go. So resources at risk, you might have seen the ICS 232 form stuck on the wall and that sort of thing and you know, assume it's the same, you know, everybody can use it, so to speak. But the, the reality is it definitely has different objectives. Well, different response objectives have different needs. Um, so our response contractors, the oil spill response organizations that are actually cleaning up the oil, and they're looking for prioritization. Where should we go? What do we need to boom first? What's the most sensitive thing that's likely to be impacted? Uh, and this is a key document for that. Uh, trustees at the state and federal level may be looking for threatened and endangered species. Are there rare species that might be impacted by this spill? The wildlife branch, in a sense, is, is uh, at least partially on, on the other side of threatened and endangered species are by definition rare. Um, so they're not likely to be present in the spill area. Um, so wildlife branch is looking at you know, what's common, what, what are we going to be filling up our care facilities with? Uh, there are certainly sensitive plants and habitats out there. And then the 232, the, the resources at risk program does also include cultural and economic resources, but we're not going to talk about that in this presentation. This is really just focusing on biology. Um, so ideally we cover everything and with time that is exactly what happens, but early on there can be different focus to meet the most urgent needs and, and that's fine. That's exactly how we should do it. That's how we do most everything in spill responses, triage. Um, we'll get to a comprehensive document, um, but you know, maybe we're going to do certain things first uh, based on need. So today I'm going to kind of focus on the strategy I use when I get called for a spill response. Um, I'm not going to be able to go through everything in detail, but kind of the approach that I use to get oriented, basically that first hour um, for me. Uh, the resources at risk is the responsibility of the environmental unit within the planning section when there is a significant event. Sometimes we have smaller events uh, where they are not a big formal ICS structure set up and we still conduct resources at risk. Uh, so, but in any event, in a formal spill, in the planning section and they are of course overwhelmed early on as well in the EU so there is help we'll talk a little bit about ACPs and GRPs those are area contingency plans that's a federal document along the coastline and geographic response plans those are inland on freshwater rivers and such in California 
The wildlife branch can help. The reconnaissance group is looking at what wildlife might be in the area, might be impacted, where wildlife might take refuge, if they've been oiled, that sort of thing. So that's certainly data that's relevant to this. And our trustee partners also know. So, or have good information. So for me, first thing, getting oriented, just this straightforward. Where is it? How do I get there? Are we talking mountains or canyons? What is this? Habitat overview, big picture. Is it a forest? Is it a desert? Uh, what, what's going on? Uh, the tools I go to first, uh, Google Earth, Google Maps, and Irma. So we'll talk a little bit about Google Earth. So zoom in here. Uh, put my I just made up a, a location of a spill. First things I might look at, okay, it's a, it's a coastal stream here or something's going on. Highway 1 is going around it. Um, so there is access, but maybe not tons of access. We've got the San Francisco Bay Area down here. So a lot of resources nearby. I wonder who owns this. Is this parkland? Is this private? Who owns California coast up here? I'm zooming in a little bit. Uh, a lot of green in here. It doesn't really strike me as California habitat. It looks kind of disturbed. So uh, maybe grazing area, coastal stream, steelhead might be an issue. You know, just kind of letting the mind wander as we go around here, zoom in a bit further and a bit further. Uh, Wetlands here, this is the spill site. So wetlands, that means to me, more likely that we have a higher number of waterfowl and amphibians than perhaps just this uh, drainage right here itself, the water. Uh, with Google Earth, you can pan it down. You can kind of get some perspective, some nice rolling hills here, face the other way. You can see it's kind of gentle around the spill site here, maybe a little steeper as you get to the water. Um, so there's a lot you can grasp there. So with just a really quick look, um, you can get a lot of basic orientation. Um, just a tip, you know, for me, I save these, just screen grab, very quick, you know, just a screen grab of the picture like what you saw here. Um, because when you're out there in the field, you don't have this perspective. Or if you have staff out there or people out there in the field, maybe you can just email or text them this information, kind of help get them oriented. Uh, next is Google Maps. I'm not really going to talk about Google Maps. I think everybody's familiar with it, but directions. There is some land ownership. You can kind of tell if that's a, a park or a forest versus private land. And then IRMA, the Environmental Response Management Application from NOAA. Um, this is public, so this login pops up. I have it checked here, but for this presentation, I did not uh, use the login credential, responder credentials. This is just the public stuff that's available to everybody. It's an amazing resource. It has a ton of information. It's available to our coast nationwide, um, but it is coastal only. And by coastal, they mean tidally influenced. So we do get some of the Delta here in California that's covered. Um, so here's our pseudo spill site, uh, geographic. So I, I'm gonna put my lat long that I got told where it is. Note here for Irma, you gotta click this geographic search if you wanna put in 23 Skidoo Street or lat long or what have you, um, because otherwise the search bar only searches uh, Irma's own data. So you click on that, put that in, then I want to get some, start getting some information. So that's unclicked. Go back to this. I think I searched for rivers here, came upon hydrology data sets. So turn on all these creeks and things. Um, I know it's a coastal stream. The spill is going to be flowing towards the ocean. Maybe I want this HF is high frequency, high frequency radar to know what the currents are doing right now. This is um, fairly real time within one to six to 25 hours ago. Um, and you can click on that to kind of see what's going on, where the oil might go if it hits the ocean. The shorelines have been mapped of different sensitivity. Cliffs are different than fine-grained sand or a tidal wetland or a tidal marsh uh, land sort of thing. So that's uh, relevance for wildlife and for cleanup. And then turn on some available wildlife data, zooming in on that. Pretty good information here. Um, it's a really good way to start. So, um, you know, if you're in a place on the coast, and I'm going to mention this again later, but uh, when we look at area contingency plans and geographic response plans, if you're in an area, you do that, this quick overview that we're talking about now, if you find that you're in an area with an ACP or a G GRP, you're going to skip what I'm about to tell you and go straight to those documents. I'm going to cover them last, just uh, so we cover the stuff that has for a spill that doesn't have that, those resources available. But uh, as I say, if you are in right along the coast or on a river with a GRP, you're going to want to go to that first. But for this process, we're going to start and say there are no planning documents available or that I've used those planning documents and now I want to kind of refine and get some better information. 
site-specific, season-specific, and that sort of thing. Uh, so IPAC is from US Fish and Wildlife. You can Google that, find your way there, hit get started, hit OK, move in, zoom into the spot. OK, here's our spill sot that we found. Um, I used the polygon tool. It's a super simple, just click drawing tool. I just went out to the highway one here, um, hit continue. And you get this nice thing with these uh, things you can pull up. You can click on marble merlets and get more information about the species and their status and that sort of thing. But for right now, my goal is I'm just trying to pull information. I want as much resource information as I can get. I'll worry about digging into species and things like that later. So I'm going to list. You get a nice list like this. Uh, I'm going to show you two options. One that's really nice and really fast is print this resource list. And you get this really well laid out document. It's got links in it. Super nice. But it's a PDF. So for me right now, early on, I want to be able to use this data. I want to be able to manipulate the data. So I want it in a, a workable format like Excel. So I'm just going to, again, quick and dirty, just grab it all, highlight it all, cut, and then paste it into Excel. It's going to be messy and not look nice. So I spent a couple minutes just to get it presentable, you know, like literally five minutes, get it presentable. Um, and then move on. And you're going to get uh, like northern spotted owl. There's probably very little likelihood that a northern spotted owl is going to be impacted by that sample spill. It's okay, right? We can cut that out later. Right now, I'm just moving fast and gathering information. So, uh, IPAC, it's good information on TNE species. It has critical habitat. You can get some map data. Um, US Fish and Wildlife is a very reliable source, of course. Uh, some of the location is a bit generalized. You got to ground truth it. All of this that I'm talking about today needs your expertise to ground truth what you're getting from databases and things. Um, that print, remember that print is pretty fast, it's good, and that you can dig a little deeper if you want more species information. Birds are obviously a big part of spill response. Uh, they're highly impacted. eBird, if you're not familiar, is an extraordinary resource. It's pretty now recognized internationally. Um, it has a ton of great information, so we'll go to explore. I use the Explore hotspots. There are other ways to go about it. There's a mass, I can't get into the wealth of data that's in this database, but um, there's a ton of information in here. So pops up to the world. We're gonna zoom in on the West Coast of the United States, zoom into our spot, birders are fanatical. All these little things are, are bird list locations, hotspot locations. I mean, there's just so much information in here. And even though this is a, a wiki source, a user populated, because there's so much data it's pretty reliable. Um, so we're going to zoom in on our, here's our spill site. Um, so even in here, which is a lot of private property, kind of a remote location on the coast, we've got quite a few hotspots available for us to look at. So we'll just take a look at one of those as an example. Uh, pop that up. We'll get 116 species are known from the area, 28 checklists. We'll view details. And here we go. We've got a list of birds in there. This goes back way into time. I'm just going to grab, I think I went back till January. Um, that's relevant for me right now. We'll also just point you out briefly, there are ways that you can qualitatively QAQC data, like top e-birders, e here's this person with 73 checklists. That's a probably a pretty serious birder. That's going to be more reliable than perhaps somebody that's just got one list they've been on vacation or something. So there's some ways to kind of optimize your, your data here, but you can get familiar with it. Uh, copy, paste into Excel. Again, it's messy. It's got things I don't need, like the person who put in the list. So quick uh, format to get this to fit in at least decently. These links are still good. eBird has tons of information. Um, I'll mention that here. Just if you want to dig down and understand where they come, like migra migrants, where they're coming from, what season they leave. You want audio recordings of calls, distribution. There's a, a huge amount of information in there. It is typically reliable data. Um, and, uh, you know, it is user by uh, user populated, so it's biased by access and things like that. But as I say, birders are a pretty fanatical group. Remember that top e birders, it's a good way to find high reliability. So another wiki tool that I use, the user populated, it's iNaturalist. Um, this is probably the most, colloquial is not the right word, um, but sort of general, general. Um, but still, you can hit explore. Uh, you get global results here, 101 million observations around the world. So we're going to zoom in on our site again. You got pretty high coverage in the area here. Um, as you zoom in here, you're going to find our site. 
and then you want to click redo the search, right? There's not 101 million observations in this location. So when you hit that, we drop down to 900 observations. This list of species comes up uh, that's that's within this mapped area. So certainly broader than our creek, but whatever. But as, as I say, right now I'm moving fast and trying to get information. So hit list, get this, same thing. Oh, uh, just a note, you know, yesterday, that's pretty current and that's pretty common in iNaturalist. eBird is pretty good too. You can get really really current information. So that can be very helpful. Again, screen grab, easy, no, no complicated effort. It's a total mess when you paste it into Excel. Um, you know, five minutes of formatting and okay, at least I got genus, species, common name, location and date. That's good. So it's generally current, uh, typically has a pretty diverse list. Some people are into slugs or, or you know, moss or what have you. you, get all kinds of different things in there. Um, again, it's user populated, so no guarantees and it's biased by access. People have to be able to get there in order to use it. So I think I've said this <clears throat> already, but remember at this point, you know, we're talking about the first 45 minutes to an hour. Um, oil is spilling, there are animals being impacted, there's a lot of mobilization going on, we're trying to move fast. So you can QA, QC and optimize the product, you'll have time to do that, or someone will have time to do that. Right now we're just trying to get as much information relevant to the site as possible. CNDDB BIOS, a California Natural Diversity Database System, um, Biogeographic Information Observation System, great program. The reason I kind of put it down here last, it, it's one that we would go to, I would go to very early. Um, but it does require login credentials, like for CDFW staff or a paid subscription, like consultants will have on there. So um, it's not available to everyone for free, uh, but it is a tremendous resource. So you scroll down, uh, just, well, you, yeah, so you uh, log into the site or Google BIOS, scroll down, you'll get to here, or one way or another, you'll get to the login page. And uh, log in there, you get this. There's a ton of information available. Zooming into the site, you get well, there's pretty good information. This is on typically sensitive species, whether it's species of special concern, T and E species, or what have you. Uh, I'm not showing the results on that because I actually did log in there and there may be confidential information in there. CNDDB and BIOS, it's reliable. Um, so, you know, it does have, it's user populated, it's biased to what areas where people are, need to do an EIR or doing studies and things like that. It's not uniform across the state. It does have good mapping functionality, which can be really useful. And some data is uh, suppressed for confidentiality or generalized. So uh, as I say, it's a strong resource. One note, and this goes to all the things, just a reminder, I think probably everybody on this call knows, but, um, just because you don't find something in any of these databases doesn't mean there aren't listed species, common species, endangered species. You know, it's that you can't prove a negative. So if you find it there, that's good. If it's absent, you still got to hunt around. The last tool I'm going to look at is using the internet, and I really encourage people to do this. It's it's some surprising how good of quality data you can find uh, just hunting around. So using our example, I might just hit Marin County endangered species, search Marin County rare wildlife, Marin County sensitive species, Marin County conservation element. Every county has a general plan within the general plan as a conservation element. Um, and that's actually what I used in this example here. So this popped up when I looked at the conservation element for Marin, pretty good map. Here's our site. We've got a variety of listed species uh, data that's available and that's described in detail in the conservation element. Um, if you can find an EIR, that's out there that's really good. Uh, there's top, awfully, often really good, really current information in there. So lastly, area contingency plans and geographic response plans. Um, as I said, I, it's important you recognize this. I put them at the end because they're, they make it sort of easy, easier anyway, to do your resources at risk, or at least initially. Um, but if you're in a spill, if it's happening, you are gonna wanna go to this first, um, if you're in an area covered by an ACP or GRP. So you can go to OSPR's page on contingency and response plans. Um, you'll find links to the area contingency plans. Those are plans I'll talk about in a second that cover the coast, uh, geographic response plans. We've got whatever this is, 12, 13, uh, geographic response plans for rivers in California. We are working on those. We're constantly building that database out more. A GRP is essentially a focused, smaller geographic area than an area contingency plan. It's a much more focused document. So looking at area contingency plans, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but 
recognize it, you need to be familiar with these documents. So the, GRP, the ACPs, excuse me, are a huge document. They tell you everything you could ever want to know about how to stand up an incident command and what every part does and all that. Um, so you got to be familiar with it to move quickly through it. Um, I know we're going to go to the Sector San Francisco plan. That'll take you to the second page with the two volumes of it. This map is going to show me where the various geographic response area uh, coverage is. Um, you can see here also that in terms of California, it's a very small percentage of California that's actually covered. Um, I know it's in GRA 1, so I'm going to go to that, click on that. We're going to get to a map. Each one of these red dots is a uh, environmentally sensitive area. And so they've, it's been pre-mapped, we've designated it. It's, a, it's an important resource to be protected. And it has a full built out strategy on how to protect that resource. Remember, uh, this is the ACP is thinking of a spill on the ocean coming to the shoreline. Um, and I'll mention that again in a second. All right, so we're gonna document. We've got, we've run through this quickly. We've gone through some databases, we're oriented. We've developed an Excel list of species. Um, we're going to use the ICS-232. This is the form that's used for this. It was developed specifically for coastal spills within an ACP area. That's what the site number would be, um, was from those numbers of those red dots that we had there, the priority, um, how fast we need to do this, the name, and that sort of thing. So looking at this, okay, we've got our spill in this area. Um, what are we going to need to do here? Remember this from earlier? I'm looking here. These little arrows are kind of swirling back in. So we see that that's happening. Um, put that over here. Okay, so we've definitely got some response strategies that are in our area that are relevant. Um, as I said, remember these two are from oil coming to the shoreline, perhaps getting into this tidal creek, um, whether or not they'd be applicable to prevent oil from reaching the ocean, that would have to be looked at. So you might keep that in mind. Uh, looking quickly at this, when you click on one of these red dots in the ACP, you get a whole bunch of good information. Where's the boom gonna go? and that sort of thing. Um, amongst that, look at that, resources at risk. We got pre primary issues. Um, so we've got all kinds of things, 450 harbor seals haul out with 50 pups in the spring. We've got cultural and historic. Remember that's part of the project, even though we're not talking about it today. Um, so a lot of really good information to jump quickly to your 232, right? So I can populate here 2166. I'm thinking we want to protect oil from getting into Tamales Bay, which is back here. So let's do that as our highest priority. Um, you can cut and paste this from the document I was just showing and move these out. I've got the lower priority ones here, but maybe if they can keep the oil from getting the, to the ocean, then maybe we're going to switch to that. So we're going to move to that. So what am I going to turn into my boss, the planning section chief? And I know I'm just about out of time. I'm just about done. Um, I'm going to turn in that document that's filled in. I'm going to turn in the CNDDB map and then the Excel spreadsheet that we have. This can be optimized later, but now we've got a lot of information that people can work with. So start with that data grab. Um, remember that as soon as you finish, like you are the person, you have dug into this and you have it, and there's a lot of people looking for information. So you can help you know, with the, IR, the OSROs. What is that prioritized protection area? Trustees say, you know, I looked at the all the teeny species, red leggers, snowy blubbers, tidewater goby jump out at me. That might be something to look at. Wildlife branch. Common species, I saw geese and heron and golden eye. They're probably going to be uh, likely to get in the way. I didn't see anything on river otters. You might want to look at that. It's amazing in deterrence. So you can just share information quickly because you're the person at that point with the most insight. Note that ACPs do not cover protection strategies on water. Um, so that's something you have to think about. My last two slides, I mean, um, the inland response. So we don't have an area contingency plan. You can still use the 232. In some areas, we have geographic response plans. So the GRP, it's just like a, a mini ACP. It has contact information. You'll find a map. You can find where your spill is. That'll give you a ton of information on what you need at that response area. You can go to it like, OK, what do we have there? Pictures. I don't know if you guys can see this. This is a big cliff. And that's really useful information. If you're thinking you're going to drive to wherever this picture was taken and walk down to the river, it's not happening. So a lot of good information you can get there. And like the ACP, we've got great wildlife data all, oops, all ready to uh, populate and get going in there. So 232 for an inland spill, same thing. Maybe I don't have a site number. Maybe I do. Like in this one, I just pretended that I didn't. So boom at the release point. Boom 10 miles down, right? Let's catch the source. Let's catch the, the leading edge. And then I'm going to turn in the same documents as we had before. And when we have time, we can go back, optimize, thin, streamline, format, what have you. 
So I'm a little over, apologize for that, but thank you. And thanks to OWCM for this uh, opportunity to speak and for the great lecture series. It's been really good, thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. That was quite a whirlwind, <laughs> um, but really, really valuable to see it all sort of laid out there. Uh, so yeah, that was great. Any questions? You can put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A or raise your hand and we can unmute you. Did I talk so fast no one can understand what I said? <laughs> it was pretty fast. <laughs> so from the OWCN perspective, the information that you guys feed us really early on in the response is, is so valuable and just planning what resources to send and how many people and you know if we need boats or ATVs. So it's really, really great information. Okay, we have a question. No, we don't. It just says, hi, Greg, thanks for the presentation. Hello. <laughs> yeah, it's it, that early time, I guess, uh, of all the take home there, there's a lot of resources you can use in that, but get oriented, get your arms around it. Don't worry about making things perfect in the first hour. You know, what we do when there's an issue with uh, OWCN and OSPR, you know, our first calls are messy. I don't know where it is. I don't know how much it is. I don't know what it is. I don't know who's out there. Um, you know, well, we don't know what resources to bring. We don't, you know, we, we talk through it and go, all right, let's, let's just gather. We know we're going to need this. We know we're going to want that. We know we're going to get these. And you, you can triage, as I said, at the outset, kind of the needs. Let's deal with the most important stuff right now. And then we'll move down to the next step and the next step. We can always refine it. We can always make it more elegant, more, more detailed. If we bring too much equipment, we can send some home. If we have too many species on our resources at risk, some that aren't going to be present, we can cut them out but start start big and then narrow down absolutely okay i don't see any questions but i do have just sort of a general question presentations will be made available they'll be through uh through canvas correct anine the recordings of the presentations or that's the, correct the yep. recordings of the webinars which will include the presentations that's correct Okay, Riley, she says, uh, wondering about baseline data and how these data are incorporated into defining resources at risk. Uh, so I guess it would depend on where the baseline data is coming from. So if it's, um, if that's one of the documents like I shared as baseline data, say uh, the IPAC from US Fish and Wildlife, the, this is where known habitat for listed species or a critical habitat, then um, you can add that. For me, I add that in the, like I, I put on those attached pages, the 232 form doesn't provide a spot to list all the resources in the area. Um, the, the 232 form was really developed specifically to prioritize cleanup and protection step, steps. Um, it's become what we use to assimilate wildlife risks and sensitive resources risks, economic and that. Um, so that's why I sort of uh, go beyond just the form because the form doesn't provide that. The wildlife branch doesn't need to know necessarily that the Osro is gonna go boom the mouth of the river. I wanna know if there's common ducks that are hanging out on the pond. So uh, put that on there. I'm not, not sure if that answers the question. Riley, does this answer the question? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so Tom says, is there any plan to develop additional info for inland areas? Yes. So OSPR is constantly working on new GRPs. There are uh, probably three or four in progress now. And when they're done, we'll do three or four more. They have a prioritization strategy. I don't know exactly what it is. I believe it factors on both the risk of spill to the river, kind of getting back to Luisa's uh, conversation as well as we are trying to spread GRP effort out around the state. Um, so putting different parts of the state as well as within each region, then looking at where's the highest risk in that area and moving on from there. Okay. 
Okay, great. Um, I don't see any further questions. Last call for questions. I just have a comment. I'm extremely jealous of your resources. That's all. <laughs> Does uh, New Zealand have something similar? Uh, we have plans for each region and, and we use eBird and all those sorts of things as well. But I mean, the, um, the maps and already predetermined um, systems that you have, that's amazing. It's really so helpful. Yeah. It's, it is a huge, if, if you think of where you can do the most good in a spill response, you know, the first eight to 12 hours is it. That's, that's where you get the most bang for your buck. And if you already know, like it's two in the morning and you can tell the Osro, just go do 2-714, 715, and 719. And by the time, you know, most of us get out there at sunrise, uh, they've already got boom in place and protect it. I mean, it's just, it's profound. And then when it comes to wildlife talking about, all right, we know we have this, you can start thinking about, am I gonna be capturing amphibians or large birds or mammals? What am I gonna, you know, it's very different, but you guys obviously know on how to, what your resources you're gonna need to do that. So yeah, it's a huge help. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Okay, Tom says, Louise, how many organizations, facilities does New Zealand have involved in your programs? Um, we, we're not set up like IWCN. We run uh, the World Wildlife Response through the government and we have volunteers which are through local government the, um, we don't have facilities set up through the country. We just take our facility with us. Um, and there's, there's someone else asked um, a question. There are rehab organizations and zoos and wildlife hospitals, one in each island it happens to be throughout New Zealand, but they're not necessarily set up for oil spill response. Um, Massey University is the only one that has uh, an oil spill response unit in it. And ironically, it's an inland city of New Zealand, which is just bizarre. Um, but that's why we are completely mobile in what we do and where we take things. It's, it's not that we don't have people who can do it. It's just that it's not set up specifically for oil wildlife. And we don't have those abilities to turn facilities into oil wildlife facilities like OWCN does. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, thank you both so much, Greg and Louise. Louise, thank you for joining us so early in your morning. We really appreciate your time and Greg's time. And thank you very much for such insightful conversation and um, for sharing all your knowledge with us. So I'm going to turn it back over to Deneen. Thank you. Um, I echo what Kira says. Thank you very much for joining us today. And Louise, again, for coming so early from New Zealand. I think it's tomorrow, actually. Um, and Greg, for all of the work you put into such an interactive presentation. Um, so both of you, thank you so much. I think this was a great topic. Again, the recordings will be made available. Louise and Greg, if you want the link, please let me know. And um, otherwise, this concludes our lecture series. And um, we're very thankful for all of our speakers for the entire lecture series and also a shout out to Kira for uh, being kind of my uh, partner in crime in this lecture series and for doing such a great job um, helping to create this and host this with me. So um, thank you all and have a wonderful day and we'll see all of you hopefully soon either on Zoom or in person. Not a drill, not a spill. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.